Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Carlos Braceres. <laughs> All right. Hello, UDOT. Did everyone have a good lunch? All right. Okay, guys, let's start off with a little definition first. I'm going to use the term UDOT over and over again today in my talk. The next 35 to 40 minutes, we'll see if I can keep it to that. And when I say UDOT, today, it means all of us. We have a lot of UDOT employees here. We also have a lot of contractors, consultants, suppliers, our exhibitors out here that make it possible for us to do this conference. We have a lot of, of our partners from local governments, from the metropolitan planning organizations, our MPOs. We have lots of partners here today. So when I say UDOT, I hope you feel that you're part of the UDOT family today. Now I want to extend a special thanks and recognition to a couple, a couple groups. We have members of our legislature here today that are coming to just hear this talk. And I just wanted to recognize them and thank them for being here. These are the key players that give us the funds and pass the policies that allow us to do what we do. And I just want to say thank you very much for being here. This is going to be tough for them, guys. They're going to have to listen to me talk instead of them. So thank you very much. We also have some members from our Transportation Commission. And as you know, it's the Transportation Commission that picks the projects that we work on, the projects that so many of you make us successful at. They're the ones that make those selections. And so I just want to say thank you, members of the commission. Thank you for being here. And thank you for all the volunteer hours that you provide to Utah and to the Utah Department of Transportation. Thank you. OK, one more thank you. And these are the people that made this completely possible. And I like the way they're dressed out here. They're wearing the orange reflective safety vests. Um, but I'd like to acknowledge and ask them to stand the members of the committee that worked all year long to make this possible, and they were led by our chairman, Monty Aldridge. Would you, Monty, would you and your team please stand so we can thank you and recognize you? <laughs> if you need anything over the next several days, please don't hesitate to ask this great team of people. Time goes fast. And I can't believe this is the fourth time I've had the opportunity to speak to you as executive director of the department. And I'm sure you all remember every word I said that first speech. I don't know about you, but I was pretty nervous. I was following the footsteps of John Nord, one of the greatest leaders I think I've ever worked with in my life. And so I was a little worried about coming in front of you as executive director. But if you recall, at that time, I announced that we were going to keep our four strategic goals. Remember, we had four, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But I introduced two different areas for our direction that I thought were very important to help us. I introduced the idea of what we call emphasis areas. And these were things that I felt we needed to work on to be, raise the bar of our organization. These are things I heard from elected officials and from the general public, that things that were important to them. And over the last three plus years, you have in fact done that. You've made a difference, and our customers are noticing what you're doing by focusing on these emphasis areas. Now, we also added something we called core values, and you saw a few of them up on the, on the little video that we ran beforehand. Now, when, I, when we came out with these values, I said at the time that these were things that I saw in each and every one of you. It reflected how we did our work. And I also said that they would continue to evolve as we evolved as a department. And as you know, recently we've added trust as a core value. I have become more and more convinced in my time in public sector that trust is the currency that allows us to do the work that we do. Every time you guys do something amazing, you're putting money into the bank account of the Utah Department of Transportation. You're allowing us to continue to do our work. So please help us become, uh, stay that very trusted organization. 
It's what means we're going to be successful in the future. Now, the second year, and there will not be a test, I promise, the second year, I think we made a very fundamental change in how we discussed what we do as an organization. We introduced the idea of a mission and a vision. Remember, a mission is why an organization exists. And if you recall, at the time, we had four strategic goals, and that fourth goal we knew was very important, but it was different, strengthening the economy. We weren't quite sure how to measure it. It wasn't, we couldn't quite see that direct connection between the inputs, the hours we worked on it, or the money that we applied, and the outcomes. But we knew it was an important part of our job. And so we did a little history, engineers doing history. And we better understood the role of transportation in the development of countries and in cities. And it became very clear that transportation is all about growing the economy and improving quality of life. It's the why we do what we do. And that's a mission statement. And so when we made the transformation from a goal to a mission, we were now able to much better communicate why we do what we do. Now, I know you and myself. We love to talk about projects. We love to talk about things like intelligent compaction or acquiring right away. There we go. Thank you, James. <laughs> Get a shout out from right away division. <laughs> we, I'll get back on track here. We love to talk about that stuff. But you know, the general public, they don't connect with that. But when we talk about why we do what we do, they absolutely connect. Because they're looking, they want to make sure they have a good job. They want to feed their families. They want to get home in time for the soccer game. Those are things that, mean, that are meaningful to them. And all of a sudden now, we've created the, the language between us and the general public that's much stronger. And I believe we have a much greater understanding of why the work you do is so important. We also introduced the vision. Now, a vision is what an organization needs to do to be successful into the future. Now, it's natural that a Department of Transportation would say, we're going to keep Utah moving. And when we talk about this, it's a very inclusive term. Not only is it cars and trucks, it's buses, it's trains, it's bicyclists, it's pedestrians, and it's even things such as data. And I'll talk more about that later. The second piece of that talk introduced something that is very important to us all introduced the fact that we were going to take on behavioral-based safety. Now, your safety is my number one priority. And we wanted to up our game. We want to be the safest DOT in the country. I want to be the safest business in the country. I want your family to know that when you go to work, you're going to come home safe. And so we embarked down a behavioral-based safety program. Every employee in the Department of Transportation has been trained. In fact, it's required for every new employee that joins us. We've made improvements. We've gotten better. Our safety numbers are better. But we can do much better. We can raise the bar. And so today, I'm pleased to announce that we're going to add to our core values safety. And my goal is, it's going to help move that culture of safety in our organization. I want safety to be something you talk about every day, no matter what you're doing. If you're changing a light bulb or you're out pushing snow on the road, how are you making sure that you're doing this in the safest way possible for yourself? For years, we've carried this safety banner underneath our zero fatalities goal. And it fit pretty well. But this is much broader than the zero fatalities goal. This is about each and every one of you. The third year, I talked about you. I talked about how you are seeing around the country, in fact, around the world. Sometimes it's hard to see how you're seen. Seeing how you're seen. Okay. Um, but I wanted you to know 
that everyone in the country looks to the Utah Department of Transportation as the most innovative DOT in the country. There's no question about it. And in fact, this was reinforced just last month. Governor Hickenlooper, governor of Colorado, led a team of business leaders here. They wanted to learn from you. Now, Colorado is a beautiful state, and Denver is growing like crazy. It's a wonderful city. But they are so concerned that their transportation isn't keeping up. And so they came here to Utah to see how we were doing it, to understand how we have developed the trust with the public and the elected officials. They trust us to give us their money to do their work. And in fact, I love this quote, and the only reason I'm going to share it is because it was in the Tribune, so I think it's fair game. Shailen Batt, the executive director of the Colorado DOT, said that while they strive to be the best DOT in the country, their target is on you, Dot. It's on you. You're recognized. Now, the second part of my talk last year, I talked about the future of transportation. I love that stuff. There's some amazing things going on. And if you remember, I kind of classified the big changes that I saw coming at us as three paradigms. I talked about electrification, automation, and mobility as a service. There's lots happening right now. And the changes that we were anticipating last year are actually happening faster than we expected. You're creating that change every day you work. The people in this room are making it happen. Now, last year, when I laid this out, I acknowledged there was lots of questions. There was great vision, but lots of questions. Now, today, there's a few more answers, but you know how this works. Every time you have an answer, there's five more questions. But what I want you to know here today is that we, the people in this room, are the right people for the job. I want to lay a little bit out what I think the future of transportation looks like when it interfaces with the Department of Transportation. Now, before I do that, I want to acknowledge one of the answers that we've learned. I talked about autonomous vehicles last year, but one of the things that we understand now much clearer is that we're not going to realize the benefits of these great autonomous vehicles. Remember? 94% of all crashes are ca caused by human error. We're not going to see our trip to zero fatalities without the need to connect these amazing vehicles to the other cars on the road and to the infrastructure. <clears throat> these cars need to be connected to our bridges, our pavements, our traffic signals, and to every other car out there in constant communication. When you think about this, it's going to completely change the relationship we have with the automobile as a DOT. In the past, automobile companies were creating wonderful cars, amazing vehicles. And DOTs around the country were building the roads and bridges for them to drive on. But now with automation, all of a sudden the person that sat in the middle, that interpreter I call him, the person that had to make the automobile interpret the road is going to start stepping away as more and more functions that that human does are being replaced with automation. That's going to require us as departments of transportation to take on a new role of becoming more integrated with these vehicles. I want to talk a little bit about that in a minute. Now, I've talked about our goals. We deliver our goals as a DOT by working on three, uh, three, our three strategic goals, by what I classify as systems, three different systems. And I'll put these systems in some silos. We do projects. We plan, design, construct wonderful projects. We maintain our transportation system. We plan maintenance activities. We execute them. We react to maintenance emergencies, and we just get it done. And then we operate the transportation system. We time traffic signals. We respond to traffic crashes. We manage traffic flow. We provide traveler information. And we've been doing a really good job 
connecting the activities within these cylinders over time. Every day we get better and better about making that connection. I call these cylinders of excellence. And data is starting to tie these together. But what we need to do is we need to find a way to connect these cylinders, these different systems, and connect them to the autonomous vehicles of the future, these connected vehicles. Data will be the bonding force in the future. Think about it. Today, we manage pavements, we manage bridges, through an asset management approach. I believe the future will have DOTs managing data as a primary asset in the future. Let's run this little video and see what this might look like for just a second. In a world of growing technology and connectivity, how does the Department of Transportation harness information that transforms the way we travel? It starts here, where the rubber meets the road. Connected Autonomous Vehicles, or CAVs, use a series of sensors to navigate roadways and measure road conditions, speed, and mobility in real time. CAVs won't be the only connected instrument on the roadway. Traffic lights, signs, even lane stripping may also have the ability to transmit data. Using data from this connected world, we can create a three-dimensional database that is stored in an information cloud utilized by a Department of Transportation and private data providers. Information transmitted from the three-dimensional database flows back and forth continuously, equipping a DOT with the intel to manage an integrated system that improves safety, mobility, and operational efficiency. Let's look at, hold your horses. <laughs> Let's look at this in a little bit more of a graphical way, if you could. You see, we have these connected autonomous vehicles down on your bottom right. We have the purple cloud, which, you know, Prince probably designed that. And we have the department here. Some of you know the reference. Um, as these vehicles collect information, an important principle we all have to understand is we don't need all the information to improve what we do, but we need anonymized information. We need to select pieces of the information. The cars today are collecting information that is almost beyond belief. They're not sharing that information today. But in the future, let's see what this might look like as we look at those three systems I described. So as we talk about projects, we're right now have a couple areas where we're piloting 3D design. We're designing projects in three dimensions and creating a three-dimensional model of what we're looking for from the contractor. And we're working towards, we're not quite there yet, but we're working towards the point that we're going to be able to advertise the 3D model as the contract document that contractors will bid on in the future. Today, in design, in e-construct, our contractors are taking our design plans and creating three-dimensional models, or they're taking some of the three-dimensional models that have been created by our design folks, and they're feeding it into their construction equipment. And what they're able to do is to build projects more effectively, more efficiently, and with higher quality. Today, that's where it ends. But in the future, I believe that as the contractor is building the job, and we know that every time you're out there, there's some changes that are made to the design that we create in the as-constructed or as-built drawings the 3D representation of the built product. Imagine a lane striper putting down the paint on the road, and at the time we're putting that down, we're recording the X, Y, Z coordinates of that line continuously. Why is that important? Well, these connected autonomous vehicles are relying on an array of sensors to be able to see their environment, to be able to drive down the road. And the lane striping is a very important feature they need to have to be able to drive. If it's snowing or if those paint lines aren't in good shape, they're going to be able to supplement and verify the, the, uh, the information that they're collecting through their sensors with the information that we have in this 3D model. In operations, you can imagine how important this information from these vehicles are. Every vehicle will actually be a data probe. We're going to know the actual speeds on every road that we're managing in real time. We're going to know when a vehicle crashes instantly 
and be able to respond. So we're going to be much more effective at operating the transportation system. Or how about maintenance? The cars today, they know when they hit a pothole. They're not telling anyone, though. So I would imagine if as soon as a car hits a pothole, the very first car, we, we are informed. And that information then goes to our maintenance forces, who then respond and fill that pothole. That means fewer cars are hitting that pothole, less damage to private property. It also means greater safety. Everyone knows what they do when they see a pothole. What do they do? They try to veer and miss it. Higher safety factor. So it has amazing opportunities for us to know how slippery the road is, or to even know if a sign's knocked down. Because the cars are going to see signs, and they're going to be verifying it in our database. And if they don't match up, they're going to tell us that a sign got knocked down. Now think of this. How many have heard of virtual reality? Is it a game? Very few people. The, the STEM kids know it. You guys better watch out. They're, they're chomping on us right here. They know virtual reality. And I think a lot of people think of virtual reality as a game. But imagine, imagine being able to use virtual reality and if you're a designer and enter into this three-dimensional model of the uh, transportation system. It's like entering into the UDOT matrix. And you could go walking down the road. You can ask to summon up the actual traffic that took place last Friday at 4.30 in the afternoon. And you could start to better design your road. What if you were trying to accommodate bicyclists in your project, and you've never ridden a bike? Well, virtual reality will let you ride your bike in traffic flow. And I believe that's going to allow you to create a better integrated transportation system. It's just amazing what can happen. Or what if you were wanting to better understand what it was like to cross one of our roads in a wheelchair? Do it. Do it in real time with real traffic. And design a more accessible transportation system for all of our users. And you can picture all the opportunities here. How about a snowplow driver? These men and women, they're out there at night in the blowing snow in whiteout conditions. Snow on the road, they can't see the traffic lines. They can't see the raised islands. They can't see the edge of the road. What if they had heads-up displays that showed the full three-dimension model of our transportation system? Would it be safer for them? Would they be able to do a more effective job plowing the road? Absolutely. You can see I get pretty excited about the future. But as much thinking about this as I have, I have a very incomplete view of what it will be and how we're going to get there. But I do know this. As amazing as this technology is, and what data can do for us, none of this is going to happen without people. It's all because of people. Remember last year I said, this is kind of like the Jetsons, it's off in the future? Guys, I'm telling you, it's now. The Jetsons are moving in next door to you. They're that loud family, and we have to make this happen. You guys are doing things right now that I couldn't have imagined three years ago. So I'm not up here asking you to do more with less. The future, and quite frankly, the present, is demanding enough. I know this. We've got the talent, the creativity, the grit, and believe me, you guys have the character to make this happen. We're doing amazing things because of who we are. Deep down. This isn't about skill sets, education, or experience. This is very personal. It's really something at your core. So let's, let's have that discussion. Let's talk about that. 
Earlier this summer, I had a chance to attend a conference. It was a WASHTO conference. We love acronyms. Western Association of State Highway Transportation Officials. And these are really good meetings. We were in Laramie, Wyoming, beautiful time of the year. And I was given the opportunity to introduce the keynote speaker. I had never heard of this guy. So they give you a little bio ahead of time and you try to pretend like you're good friends when you introduce these people. James P. Owens. Now, Jim was a Wall Street banker, but he left Wall Street because he was completely disillusioned with what he saw as a lack of values on Wall Street. Does that surprise us? No, I don't think so. Jim talked about the fact that the cow he used the cowboy as a metaphor, and he talked about the cowboy code. You guys have heard of this thing before. Remember? You do what you say you do. A handshake is as good as a contract. And what he was telling us is that we all have it in us. Each and every one of you has a set of deeply seated values that really define who you are. But what most of us haven't done is we haven't taken the time to write it down. And he said, once you get a chance, take the time to write down your values, your code, your principles, whatever you want to call them, it'll make a difference because you're going to know who you are. Now, when he was done speaking, I chased him down. It wasn't hard for me to catch up to him. He was an older gentleman. And I bought his book. And as I read his book at that time, I became convinced this is something that I wanted to talk to you about today. Now, it's easy for me to talk. Most of you say, well, is he done yet? It's easy for me to talk about the future. But this stuff is kind of hard. It's very personal. And it's a little uncomfortable, so I'm going to do it but I, because I trust you guys. And I think it's important. So I want to share three of my values. And I'm going to explain a little bit of why they mean what they mean to me. Because I think it will help reinforce the importance of going through some, this type of an exercise. Now before I start, I want you to understand this. These are mine. They may be yours. And my intention is not for you to say, Carlos said this, and therefore he must want me to make this my value. No. This is me. We'll talk about you in a few minutes. I want to start with this. I call it believe in yourself. I think you've all kind of would understand what this is about. I think this is a very important thing all of us have to believe in. But I strongly believe in myself and what I can do. When I was very young, I was diagnosed with dyslexia. Now, those of you that don't know what it means, it means I really couldn't read and I couldn't spell at all. But thank God, I have a very, very stubborn mother. And she is somebody who believed in me. And through brute force repetition, she basically taught me how to memorize myself into becoming a good reader. Today, I love to read. I still can't spell at all. But her belief in me taught me to believe in myself and to overcome something that was considered a disability actually helped me become better at memorizing things and became an advantage. And this was really important for me later on. Some of you may know that my first college degree was to be a geologist. I had this dream. I was going to run around the world in the outdoors with a rock hammer in my hand, and I was going to make great geologic discoveries. It was going to be a wonderful life. <laughs> this dream came crashing down incredibly quickly. 
And I found myself, our company went out of business, and I found myself dropped off, literally dropped off with all of my belongings, second week of December, in Billings, Montana. I had no job. I had no career. I had no car. And I was by myself. But because I believed in myself, I believed I could start over. I decided to return to Utah. I got a job tending bar at Snowbird. I met my wife. I went back and got a degree in civil engineering because it was important to me to know that I could work where I wanted to live, and I wanted to live in Utah. It was only because I believed in myself that I was able to work full time, go to school full time. A lot of you have done that. Now, I added an added complication. I probably skied more than most people do in a lifetime. It was really good. But I believed in myself. I believed I could start over. Next idea I'd like to share with you is one I call, there ain't no quit in me. Now, this probably comes from my mother. I'm pretty stubborn. When I start trying to do something and I can't figure it out, I won't stop. You should see me on a computer. I can cause a lot of damage before I figure it out. In fact, I remember when I first started at the department, I was interviewing for a job on the rotation program. Some of you know what that is. I was interviewing with a gentleman by the name of Bio Chang. He was a deputy construction engineer at the time. And Bio asked me this question that every one of us should be prepared for at an interview. I hadn't thought ahead. He said, what is your greatest skill? Well, there it is. Serve it up, softball, hit it out of the park. What did I say? Well, I can make more mistakes faster than anyone else. It's like, crap, did I say that? I quickly said, but I won't make the same mistake twice. I figured, okay, well, that's, I got through that. But I'm telling you, I think that's so important. We can't be afraid to make mistakes. The only people that get things done are the people that are willing to step out. You show me someone who says they've never made a mistake, and I will guarantee you that person hasn't done anything meaningful or significant in their life. Now, I love hearing about the things you do and are successful. And I even love hearing about the things you try and don't work. Just don't tell me you're not going to try. I can see I got Jason laughing at that one. Last one I want to share with you is one I call give it your all. Now, this isn't the same thing as don't quit. And I love this quote here from Abe Lincoln. Whatever you are, be a good one. I strongly believe that every life, every job should be meaningful. Now, one of the things I also wrote down under this value for me was to make a mark. I want to know that I've made a difference to the people around me. Most of you have heard this metaphor. I call it the bucket metaphor. And I've found myself using it too. And I try to stop myself. You know, when I leave this job, It'll be just like pulling a hand out of a bucket of water. And I understand what they're trying to say, but I just don't buy it. I want to know what I've done has made a difference. Some of you may remember a good friend and was one of my better mentors, Byron Parker. He was a supervisor here at the department. Byron was a quiet, great leader. And I became, when I became my, had my first opportunity to be a supervisor at UDOT, I was promoted into a project design engineer's job. It was an amazing job. Best job at the department I've had, other than this one. Um, but we had a small design squad of engineers and design technicians. We worked in the fourth floor of the complex, and we were designing projects all over the state. And I knew I was picked to be that leader because 
I was the best designer in the state, right? Had to be the reason. And I set out to prove it every day. I worked long hours, I worked hard, and I was in everyone's face, sun up to sundown. And things weren't quite clicking, but I didn't understand why. And one afternoon, Byron, in his quiet way, his little smile, just does this. Carlos, step into my office. You know, we used to call, Byron had the nickname The Godfather. And Byron just told me, Carlos, you're driving everyone crazy. What? I'm working hard. He goes, that's not it. You're trying to do everyone's job. You're changing their work. Your job is to help support them. Lead and support. Byron made a difference to me that I try to remember every day. And I'm constantly reminded on those days that I don't remember Byron's lesson. But he made a difference to me, and I want to be the person that makes a difference to somebody else. Now, in order to give it your all, it takes a lot of energy to do it every day, day after day. You have to come ready to play. And I feel a responsibility to take care of myself to be able to do that. In fact, Governor Herbert once asked me, Carlos, does that sound like the governor? Remember he called us last year, Carlos, do you have the energy for this job? I said, Governor, I focus on three things to fulfill my responsibility. I try to sleep right every night. So I try to get seven to eight hours every night. I think that's part of my responsibility. And that's hard to do. You guys know that. I try to eat right at every meal. Every meal. I did not have one piece of Halloween candy all day yesterday. Not one. It wasn't easy. And I exercise every day. I do those three things every day to be able to take care of myself and give 110%. Now, I want to share a quote with you that I found that I think reflects this. I'm not going to read this quote to you. But there's one line I do want to read to you because I think it's important. It's an important message. Work regular hours. I think this quote reflects the responsibility that I feel to be able to give it my all here at the department. Now I've got seven more, and so we have a choice here. We can spend the next 45 minutes going through them. I have a story about each one. But I think it's more important to talk about you. And to think about your values. You've got them, but how do you figure them out? They may be a truism that you've heard from a coach or a loved one at some point in your life. Now for me, when I thought of how I was going to do this, because I said I wanted to do this, I thought I'd sit down in a quiet spot and write them down. But I found myself on a beautiful Saturday afternoon riding my bike up Immigration Canyon. That's not me. I don't look anything like that. And for me, when I ride my bike, I ride it for mental relaxation. That's what I get out of it. And I go through various phases. I go through complete exhaustion. You're wondering, what am I doing? And then I go through pain, where it hurts. And then I find myself in what I call the zone, for me. Thoughts come very freely, very easily. It's a very free time. And I found myself thinking about Jim Owens and the Code of the West. And ideas came to me about who I was. So I got home and I wrote them down. Some of the things that I took away from the process that I think are important, because I encourage you to go through this. If you think about doing this, find a way to get into your zone. Find that place where you're relaxed, your thoughts are very unencumbered, and there's no threats. Trust your gut. You're going to know things about yourself instinctively. 
Don't second guess those. Write them down. Think about when you've been at a crossroads in your life, when you've dealt with extremely difficult situations. How did you act? What did you do? Or how about those times when you've been most proud of yourself? You've done things where you said, I really like that. These are the things that you should be thinking about. Now, why in the world would a damn engineer be standing in front of you talking about all this soft stuff? You're probably asking yourself that right now. And it's because I firmly believe that how we define success in life and at UDOT is about finding the right balance. At UDOT, we have our mission. That's why we do what we do. We have our goals. That's what we do. And we have our values, both our corporate values and our personal values. That's how we do our work. How we get there matters. And what I mean by that is the ends never, ever justify the means. If we've been successful in our goals, but we haven't stood and lived by our values, that's a very shallow and short-lived victory. Now, I know we all want to do what's right. And in fact, doing what's right was on the first cut of my values. But as I worked through this, I came to understand that it's by living by our values that helps us know what is right. Knowing when you're not willing to cross a line, when you're not willing to compromise, that's hard to do, especially when you're in a group situation. Knowing who you are at a very personal level will help you know when you're not willing to cross that line. Many of us remember our good friend Jim McMinimi. Jim understood this. Jim would always send people off on a very difficult assignment, and he would say, to remember yourself and remember what you stand for. He got this. Knowing who you are and what your values are will give you the confidence to stand your ground. And once you've done that, you're going to be confident. You're going to like yourself. It is the best and truest you it will make you confident enough to take risks. It will make you brave enough to innovate. Now, I believe in you. But it's more important that you believe in yourself. Because we're moving so fast into this future of transportation, and we're making up the rules as we go. To be able to do this, you have to trust yourself and you have to trust your organization. Now think of this. Think of our mission. Our role is not the builder of roads. Our role is much bigger. Our role is the builders of the communities of our dreams. Now I know my expectations are high, but I have no doubt you're going to exceed them. I hope your expectations for yourself are even higher. Your work should be rewarding and exciting, even on the most demanding days. You should go home feeling good about what you've done here. You should relax with your family and the activities that you love, and you should come back tomorrow ready to do it again. We are the best DOT in the country because of this. Now, these are the things that make UDOT great. We are innovative because you are innovative. We are capable because you are capable. And we get things done because you guys get things done right. Individually, you guys are amazing. 
but collectively, you are the key to the future of Utah and the United States. You are changing the world. Thank you for being here, you guys. Have a great conference.